Now that's what I call a dramatic title. And while it is a scary title, it is also a specific title. One D&D is going to ruin my life, but you should probably be fine. Let's talk about it. Imagine you make cookbooks for a living. The recipes inside are put together based off of your knowledge of how food has worked for years. You pair unique combinations of flavors together to help people at home create wonderful dishes. Some only appeal to those who have a bit of an odd palate, but all work according to the basic rules of food. Now imagine Food 2. Food 1 was such a big hit, why wouldn't we make Food 2? The makers of Food say that your Food 1 cookbooks will still work with Food 2, though there will be some small changes. Eggs take four minutes to cook instead of three. Apples are now called oranges, and oranges are gone altogether. Also, there's a new fruit called palm blue that tastes like apples used to. It's a hundred small little changes. The overall concept of food is still the same, but all those cookbooks and recipes you wrote no longer are relevant. They could create some dubious food. Food 2 isn't out yet. It comes out in a year, but the food company is testing out new types of food and asking people what they think about the food. Some of those changes could be scaled back if they're unpopular. There's going to be Food 2 surveys to make sure that everyone is happy with the direction of food. That's not really helpful for the cookbook author. You're now in a limbo year where every recipe you write could be irrelevant next year. If you want, you could try and anticipate what new Food 2 rules will be become standard and equate your recipes to that right away. But that's just as risky as assuming Food 1 is going to stick around, which is also an option. The food company could decide it's too much hassle and just stick with Food 1. Now any changes you made in anticipation of Food 2 will have been a waste of time and make those recipes irrelevant. Now obviously once the year is up, you'll know the rules of Food 2 and you can probably remake your old recipes in the new Food 2 food system. But for now, printing new recipes is how you make money and people buying your old recipes. Older recipes that again could become totally irrelevant in the next year. So, big long metaphor, that's how I'm feeling about 1D&D. Any opinions I have on the actual design changes of 1D&D are minimal. The issue I have is that 1D&D is going to kill my entire backlog and everything I work on this year in terms of building character could be a huge waste of time because it's just going to go away in a year. Maybe people will still play 5e, I know some people still play 3.5e, some weirdos even play 4th edition or 2nd edition or 1st edition if they want to do kind of a retro gaming kick, but the majority of people are gonna go to Food 2, which should more accurately be called Food 6. And that's why you, the cookbook reader, will probably be fine. Dungeons & Dragons has always had new editions. Original edition came out in 1974 and lasted three years before the advanced version in 1977, which lasted 12 years before the second edition in 1989, shoutouts to T-Swift, that lasted 11 years until third edition, though the real third edition came out in 2003 as 3.5, which lasted five years until fourth edition in 2008, and was replaced faster than any other edition in 2014, only six years later. By the time one D&D actually comes out in 2024, it will have been 10 years since 5th edition. That's pretty on par with other edition changes other than the 4 to 5. We'll talk about why that was so short later. Honestly, my biggest critique with 1D&D is the name. Why not just call it Sexy? Is it because it sounds too close to sexy? It could be sexy. You could make it sexy. Undo a button, that's what I do. My guess is they're afraid of you. People don't like change. I know it's ironic coming from the guy who, you know, made that thumbnail. But with Dungeons and Dragons more popular than ever, any amount of change is gonna scare some people, whether they're good or bad. Most of the changes I've seen aren't good or bad. They're lateral moves. But 5e was never a perfect system. System. I've had my complaints with rules as written. The rules as written are regularly corrected on Twitter by the designers of the game so everyone knows what they actually meant to say. That leads to home tables making their own rules and everybody learns the rules at the home tables and then nobody actually learned the rules of 5e to begin with. People don't learn how to play Dungeons and Dragons from a book. People learn how to play Dungeons and Dragons from a table. Most people learned from their first DM, and their first DM might have been doing some weird shit. 
Sometimes that weird shit is even more fun. Did you know a natural 20 on a skill check is just like a 20 plus your modifier? In rules as written it is, and a natural one on a skill check, same thing. It's just a one plus your modifier. So if your rogue has a plus 400 stealth modifier and rolls a natural one, does it really matter? It's still 401. But if you want to play with ones and 20s mattering for skill checks more, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. So if one D&D comes out and you don't like the rules, just don't do them. Jeremy Crawford can't bust down your door and arrest you for deciding that the DM gets to crit, something that's already been changed, by the way. That was a really unpopular part of the one D&D Unearthed Arcana, and they already changed it in the newest Unearthed Arcana. They're like, nope, we're not doing that anymore. It's already done. It's almost like this is playtest material that you can respond to, and they will listen to your feedback and adjust it accordingly. And again, if you don't like something, you can just homebrew. As long as, of course, homebrew isn't made permanently illegal. Do you have any idea what they do to people like us? We're not talking about some dumb mail fraud scheme. Wait! Made homebrew. Okay, I'm gonna try and make this fast. Fell the Lev already made a video about the open gaming license and whether or not we need to poop our pants about it. By the way, we don't need to poop our pants. I was in the video, I talked about the big scary D&D is under monetized article and why it's also not very scary. For those who don't know, the open gaming license is what allows everyone to make homebrew. You can use the standard reference document, basically the player's handbook stuff, and Wizards of the Coast won't sue your buns off. It is incredibly nice and generous, but also financially lucrative for them, because Hasbro's most important D&D &D game is not D&D, &D, it is Monopoly. Like I said earlier, 5e is not a perfect tabletop RPG system. It's debatably not even the best tabletop RPG system, and it probably isn't the best tabletop RPG system for your homebrew campaign. But I still made 400 videos about Dungeons & Dragons because it is THE tabletop RPG. Comparing Pathfinder to D&D is like comparing Matt's Bar to McDonald's. Matt's Bar is a local Minneapolis institution. They make a Juicy Lucy burger, that's where they put the cheese inside the burger. Not the biggest fan of it, but there's a reason you haven't heard of it, and you have heard of McDonald's. McDonald's is way bigger! Still, Pathfinder exists and kinda killed 4th edition. Or I guess, D&D killed 4th edition by making Pathfinder exist? For those unaware, the open gaming license of 3rd edition is what Pathfinder is based off of. Because 4th edition didn't have an open gaming license, and people were pretty pissed off. So D&D's biggest competitor is just also D&D. And then made D&D reboot itself in six years with an open gaming license again. This outrage came from the 2009 internet. That's the David after dentist era of YouTube before the YouTube D&D community was even really a thing. So when I say that Wizards of the Coast won't get rid of the open gaming license, I mean, they probably won't. And if they do, that's a terrible idea, especially when they're telling people to learn a new system already. Think about it. If they're saying everyone has to learn our new system and also you can't make homebrew in our new system, why wouldn't everybody just learn a new system that they can make homebrew in? The biggest competition D&D has ever faced happened because of a bag fumble 13 years ago. I don't think they're gonna fumble the bag in the same way again. And if they do, we all just learn Pathfinder. Or we just make Pathfinder again. And I'm saying that as someone who makes homebrew. A pretty substantial part of my Patreon audience is there for my homebrew stuff. Obviously, it would be best if we can keep working in D&D, but it's not the end of the world if we have to go to a new system. Or, again, just use the 5th edition open gaming license and literally do the exact same thing they did with Pathfinder to make our own system that is just the old system of 5e. So yeah, actually, I was wrong. The choice is not learn our new system without an OGL or learn a new system with an OGL. You can just get rid of learn a new system and stay in the system that still has the OGL. Oh, also they said the OGL is gonna exist for one D&D. There's just gonna be a user agreement. You have to report earnings over 50K and pay royalties at $750,000. Wait, that's scary. <laughs> Hey, there's already a user agreement. If you're making homebrew for 5e, you're doing a user agreement with the existing OGL. That's what the OGL is. It's the agreement. It's just more of an honor system, or to be honest, probably more of a they don't give a shit system. 
D&D brings in hundreds of millions of dollars a year. They really don't care if your Kickstarter makes $30,000. Making it something that you actually have to actively read through and sign before you make your homebrew is probably just to protect the brand. Imagine the more, uh, fashy? members of the D&D fandom decide they want to make a homebrew subclass for Paladin called the Oath of Racism. It's deliberately inflammatory, it's made to offend and piss off the libs, but they love pissing off the libs so it becomes a pretty big success. Now you've got some articles published about the Oath of Racism Paladin, and Wizards of the Coast is dealing with damage to the brand. They have an actual written user agreement that people have signed and had to read the clear rules of. They can shut that down. Cease and desist. Done. Now, is there going to be anything in that agreement that stops hate speech? I don't know. It's not out yet. I think it'd be a good idea. So, let's move on to reporting income of over $50,000. Why would they do that? Because they're gonna sue the pants off of you and steal all your money. I actually have two other theories that are probably more realistic. Theory one, data. They just wanna see what's popular. They see a bunch of homebrew people have made a $50,000 cheeseburger race. They'll make a cheeseburger race. It's not something they ever thought to do before, but they'd see a demand for cheeseburger species and say, oh, you can play as a cheeseburger now. Now, that's not great for the people who made the original cheeseburger homebrew, but they've already gotten paid $50,000 for the cheeseburger homebrew, so they can just move on and make a pizza species. Theory two, they just want to flex. Not only can they tell their investors how much money their books printed, but they've created an entire secondary market of people making homebrew for D&D. Adding all the people who make $50,000 or more together into a pool lets them inflate the value of the brand, even if they're not the ones who made that money. They can say, oh, we're also part of this. Look at how much money we made. Maybe give us some more money. It's a good investment. Again, that's not great, but as far as capitalism goes, that's not that bad. It's tantamount to fraud, I guess. As far as out and out plagiarism goes, that sounds like a PR nightmare. And if they're plagiarizing someone who made it $50,000, that's not a small Kickstarter. There are quite a few people who backed that Kickstarter and could get a viral campaign going pissed off at Wizards of the Coast. It's gonna do way more damage to the brand than just making their own thing. Uh, and finally, if you're making over $750,000 based off of a different IP, yeah, you should probably pay royalties. You're almost a millionaire and that money wouldn't exist if D&D didn't exist. So yeah, at $750,000, I think royalties are reasonable. That affects like four people. It all comes down to not damaging the brand. Breaking the open gaming license would damage the brand. That's not what Hasbro wants. Hasbro wants D&D to make money. Because remember, D&D is very under-monetized. Uh, the first thing I saw with it is the brand is really under-monetized. Okay, I talked about this in Fellow Lebs video. Go check it out. Plug, plug, plug. I'm going to dive in a little deeper here, mostly to justify the fact that I watched a 44-minute investor webinar, and that was really boring. Nobody else watched it. It was posted on December 8th. Dicebreaker did a breakdown of it on December 9th. Everyone read that, pooped their pants, and we're here today. As I mentioned in Fell's video, it's not really even about D&D. It's about Magic the Gathering. But I don't think the Magic the Gathering section is useless in terms of Dungeons and Dragons. It helps you figure out Hasbro's ideal marketing strategy. Remember, this was a webinar for Hasbro investors, not fans of Magic the Gathering. So they're not trying to get the fans excited. They're trying to tell these people that they're going to make money. If anything, they should be talking about Magic fans like a farmer talks about a cow, but they kind of don't. The brand strategy seems to be make fans happy and bring in more fans rather than milking the existing fans with a bunch of extra cards that you don't need or price hikes. Hasbro CEO Chris Cox calls this the Blue Point 2.0 initiative. They want to get more customers by focusing on play and doubling down on storytelling within their games. Oh, and Chris calls D&D the poster child for this initiative. He's pretty much silent. For the 32 minutes of the meeting they're talking about Magic the Gathering, he only perks up to talk about D&D, which is pretty good because he's one level more removed than the president of Wizards of the Coast, and he seems pretty hands-on when it comes to D&D. They want to make movies, they want to make video games, they want to charge you for skins. That's it. That's the big scary evil thing. They're not getting rid of the open gaming license. They don't even really talk about 1D&D. Why am I simping so hard for a billion dollar company? This feels wrong. Okay, let's back this up. Remember, if any of this changes and the open gaming license goes away, our strategy is fuck them. We'll make our own 5e, we'll learn Pathfinder, or maybe we'll even see the sun again. 
The point is, nothing has changed yet. The changes will be telegraphed, and the changes so far aren't all that bad. Seems like everything's gonna be fine, and even if it's not fine, it will be fine, even for me. So this video is really a little therapeutic for me and also a way to make an announcement that I'm sure isn't going to be popular with some people. The building character videos haven't been doing the best as of late. I'm not blaming the audience. I'm not really even blaming myself. There's just 500 of them. First episode, I built Captain America. Very popular character. Now I'm building the second most popular ice-themed Flash villain. That's just not as appealing. I know there are some people who love Killer Frost. She ain't Steve Rogers. This has been happening gradually for a while, so gradually I kind of didn't do anything about it until the one D&D stuff came out. You might have noticed I've been plugging the Elden Ring stuff a lot. Some of you hate that because it's not D&D, even when it was D&D, and I was just making a third episode of Building Character a week about Elden Ring without affecting the other Building Character schedule. So thank you. Your opinion has been noted, and you are wrong. If I'm gonna keep doing this long term, I can't keep scraping the bottom of the barrel for more D&D character builds. I just can't. There are still some big names I wanna do, and building character isn't going away entirely. It's just gonna go down to one episode a week. And when one D&D comes out, I get to start the series over again. Lots of you have wanted me to start over anyway, and I always thought that was a terrible idea, but now there's a reason to. There's a new system that's totally new, not just new subclasses, because if I tried to do it for every time there was a new subclass, I'd have to restart the show every three months. That wouldn't have worked. New system, new series. That works. Thursday's gonna be a lot more like this. I'm gonna be doing D&D news, I'll be doing homebrew, stuff like that. And sometimes, I won't talk about D&D at all. Sometimes, I want to calculate the value of a human soul, according to a Nickelback song. Or maybe I'll help you review anime for your friend who doesn't like anime. I'm gonna explore things I'm curious about, make sure that I actually like the scripts before I hit publish, and take my time to make sure that the video is good. I might even miss an upload, who knows? I'm afraid of change. You might be afraid of change but I know YouTube is afraid of change, for sure. A little inside baseball thing here. If you're a YouTube creator and you try and post something that isn't just the normal stuff you normally post, some of your audience isn't gonna wanna watch it. And then YouTube just kills it on delivery because some of your audience didn't show up to watch it. So please give these new videos a shot. I'm gonna try and make them very interesting. And if you wanna support me extra hard, you can go join the Patreon. That's where all the homebrew stuff's gonna be. We're diving back into homebrew hard this year. I'm also gonna be opening up a few slots for me to run D&D sessions for some of you. That's gonna be for patrons only. And check out Two Lock and Mango. That's where I'm posting video game challenge stuff. Elden Ring, Pokemon, Kingdom Hearts, maybe Hades, who knows? I do, I'm making the schedule. Thank you for watching and continuing to support me through these years. I know change is scary, but we can get through this together. Whether those changes are in D&D, YouTube, or some horrible combination of the two.